All right. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, villagers around the world. We have folks from San Francisco to New York, to London to India. We have people all around the world tuning in, and we're so excited to have one of our very own, Peter Briffith, the co-founder of WageStream, um, uh, a, a breakout portfolio company at Village Global, and someone who's thought a lot about enterprise sales and go-to-market. Peter, welcome to the masterclass. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's nice are, to be uh, so excited. Not an enterprise buyer. <laughs> um, so, Peter, let's uh, let's start with the early days of WageStream. Tell us how did you and tell us what the company does a little bit, like in thirty seconds. But then talk about sales in the early days. How did you effectively qualify prospects and identify the early adopters, and then close those initial sales? Yeah, it's great. It's a, it's a great question. You guys can see. I was I was nineteen when I started WageStream. It's aged me. That was five years ago. So. Enterprise sales is, is definitely um, a lot harder than I think we thought when we started WageStream. But I should just give you a bit of background on we do because, you know, you guys will all have different technologies and you'll be providing different solutions to, a, you know, to an enterprise. Um, it, we're, so WageStream essentially is providing, you know, we're trying to um, provide fair financial services to lower income workers. And we do that by making the employer essentially the bank and the provisioner of these financial solutions. Um, our primary product is flexible pay, you may know as earned wage access. So um, we specifically target large enterprise in certain sectors. And when we, um, when we sign a client, we have to integrate with their workforce management systems and their payroll system. So it's a reasonably heavy lift. Um, and it's a benefit that's available to, you know, in their entire organization, which may be, you know, um, 40, 50,000 people. So um, we're born out of London. We're now um, operating in the US. And, you know, our largest client is is Asda in the UK, which is about 170,000 people um, employed by Asda. It's a big grocer. Um, and you'll know like Floor and Decor over here, Crate and Barrel, Popeyes, all clients. Um, and so Peter, we... just to get a sense of scale, what's the general revenue trajectory and number of sales reps at Wagestream today? Yeah, so we're we've got over two million, um, you know, employees now that we impact through through our client base. Um, we have a we're we're a company of about one hundred and sixty people, and there's about twenty five um, individuals within our sort of commercial team. And I could talk about how we structure that and how we've built that, um, but that's how it sort of breaks down. We're very, you know, we're a technology company, so the rest of yeah. it's engineering and support, but. Um, how to put together a go-to-market structure. Um, you know, we've made probably every mistake in the book in terms of how not to do enterprise sales. So um, yeah, so let's that, start. Let's start with those. Let's start with that framing because I love that of mistakes. Like if you could roll the clock back to the pre-seed seed days of WageStream and do it over, uh, what yeah. would you do differently in terms of closing those first three to five customers? How would you think about the the process of enterprise sales differently? Well, I mean, exactly. I think I think you know I still debate why we wanted to go after enterprise. Like our solution, we want to impact millions of people, and we just determined that you know enterprises would would get most benefit from our solution. But I think for anyone pre seed C, do question this. Right, enterprise is in incredibly difficult to acquire. Um, we're, we're all small businesses. They're large businesses. Um, and the, the ability for you to get in the door there and get a solution that is very high risk to them. You have to remember this. I didn't realize this at the time. Um, but as it, we, we're providing a technology they've never bought before. Um, we're moving money. We're moving vast sums of cash. Um, we're integrating with their payroll systems. We're integrating with their core workforce management system. So we present a huge risk. I didn't think... I didn't really understand that when we started. Um, and you're dealing with buyers that are very, you know, enterprise people that work in enterprise are very risk averse. If they weren't risk averse, they would probably work for you, right? But they don't. They work. They don't work in startups. And you know, we take risk. We risk risk for breakfast, sort of thing. That's what we probably enjoy, right? If you started a company and you're you're building something, risk is almost part of the part of the gig. But you're dealing with career professionals. Their big concern is. Where, where what's you know what's my what, is this good or bad for my career um and that's their main intent it's not is it good or bad for my employees or for my company or building out a solution that their, their, their core concern in the main unfortunately is is this good for my career and as a young startup with an innovative solution you present a very high risk to their potential career so i think you have to think about that um but going back to your question ben i think you know when we started wave stream we thought oh this is amazing we're going to give 
every you know lower income worker access to their money so they don't fall into debt the whole world will want this we'll probably we'll probably I, I think you know have we got enough security at the doors for all these ceos that we're going to want to come and sign enterprise agreements with us as soon as we launch we thought there'd be a plethora of interest yeah you need to make sure your product's really scalable and secure and just you know exactly. it's got to have all those things at the beginning right exactly. <laughs> and, well, you know no there was no queue at the door right there was nothing um we start i said what's going on why don't people want this so we started calling out cold calling um and it was very very tough in the early days because the toughest part of starting any enterprise sales business is not having an enterprise right because the the biggest asset you have when you have an enterprise is you've got someone else using you um and to the to the to the new buy or the prospect you're talking to you present less of a risk if, if another company is using your solution. Um, and I'll, we can talk about how we evangelize and, and make those things happen. But yeah, really tough in the early days. We actually ended up doing a, um, because we couldn't get in the door anywhere. No one would talk to us. Um, everyone was like, what is this money on an app? This is, this is some sort of wizardry. We can't have this. We just thought everyone would want flexible pay and it, it wasn't the case. Um, and it, it, you have to think about what you're providing to the client if you're providing a whole new technology they've never bought before, you're even higher up the risk scale because they're like, why do I need this? I don't have it now. So, it's not so like we're important, well, they've already yeah, got yeah. It's something like so, that. So Peter, how important is lead qualification? You think in the very early days, you're just getting the enterprise sales motion going. It's so hard. These are risk averse buyers. They don't want to buy from a startup. Do you think startups should really just cast a really wide net and, and place a ton of bets or do you spend a lot of time trying to figure out the perfect customer architect? I think, you know, you need to really focus on a sector and think about that as part of the sales process. But at the beginning, your one goal in life is get a customer. That is all you want. You want a client using your technology because then everything else is going to be a lot easier. Um, we as a business very much focus now on hospitality, healthcare, and retail, because those are the sectors that are buying our solution. And we've learned that, but we had to cast a very wide net at the beginning. We ended up actually, we uh, part of our sort of proposition was that we're going to kill off payday loans, stop your employees going into debt. Um, so we had a big company in the UK called Wonga, which anyone who lives in Europe would, have, would know that name. It was... Um, the press hated them. Everyone was going after them. They actually went into bankruptcy. And as a result of that, we did this PR stunt across uh, Millennium Bridge, which is one of the bridges go across the Thames, with a with a coffin called Wong, with big Wonga sign on it, with a big coffin. And we had to employ actors as well as part of the funeral procession. We didn't have enough staff at the time. But we got all the press turned up, took pictures, and that picture went on the front of every single major newspaper in the UK. Um, and as a result of that, a client, one of our initial clients called Rentacle, the CEO of Rentacle saw the, the press and said, that's, I actually want that product for my staff. He had come from, you know, Rentacle's like pest control. So he was catching rats as a, as a 16 year old. And now he'd gone all the way up 40 years to CEO. So he, he understood some of the financial pressures his staff were under. Yeah, and he, I, he did. He bit. So that was the reason we, we cast a very big net. Do yeah, something. Pest to do and you kind of did like guerrilla marketing, which reminds me of like the old Mark Benioff playbook when launching Salesforce.com more than 20 years ago to sort of steal market share from Siebel, some epic stories of Mark's playbook, which he talks about in his book, Behind the Cloud, by the way, which I found a really interesting book, a little dated now, but fascinating history of the early days of Salesforce. But Peter, coming back to the psychology of these early buyers. So you said, you know, we're startups, we're selling to, to, to any enterprise buyer, especially larger companies. They're really risk averse. People care about their careers. Buying the risky startup product is not going to help them in their career. Do you think we should focus on um, trying to convert a risk averse person to somehow figure out their psychology and sell them our product? Or do we just try to find the one out of 100 early adopter? Like, do you, do you just keep hunting to find the person that actually has that psychological profile? Or is there like an education process you can engage in to, I, I think, to turn I a think risk averse you, person into a yeah, buyer? It's a great question. If you're selling a new technology, you've got, to you've got to understand you've got to pay an education tax to the market, which means you have to educate the broader buyer community in, in what you're doing. Um, and we've had to pay that tax um, in the UK, in the US. Um, so there's, de there's, there's definitely that. I think... We cast, we did, we did these guerrilla marketing, uh, you know, types of stunts, and that, and therefore, and we found someone uh, because of that. We spread a very wide net, and, and an individual that had a need came to us. Um, so, so I think, you know, the the major thing you want to do is try and land a client. You will find someone eventually that it has a bigger risk appetite than the the remain. Like humans are, are different beasts, and and you will find someone that does that. So. I'd suggest you do that. Um, when you actually get into understanding the sector you want to focus on, 
um, the businesses you want to focus on. I think the psychology of the buyers is incredibly important, um, but do anything possible to get that first customer. But you've also got to remember with enterprise sales, and this is why it's completely different to SME, it needs a completely different, you know, go to market, a different muscle in the business. You can't just use SME sellers to go to enterprise. You've got to understand the one key um, factor of enterprise sales is it's consensus decision making. It's not one individual. Um, we made that mistake with the amount of meetings that we went to where we, well, our buyer, by the way, is a, is a head of people, HRD. We made an evangelist of that, out of that individual and then thought, well, this is a, we got this deal. This is, this is happening. And then you realize they've got to go and sell it internally to potentially another 15 people, in our case, heads of security, heads of payroll, operations directors, potentially the CEO. Now, just think about that, you know, for a bit. Like, how do you think they're going to sell it? Right? They're not going to sell it like you sell it. They're not going to have... Right. All the all the objection handling and all the core knowledge you have on your product, they're probably going to do a horrible job of selling that internally. And that's why a lot of deals die. You'll go into a meeting, have a great meeting with a large enterprise. Say, we got this. The amount of salespeople I've seen have come off. We've got this contract. It's almost signed. The ink's, you know, and it's, and, and I, I'm, now, I'm now very, very much more cynical these days. You've got no chance of buying that, you know, until we know the businesses, we've got proper stakeholder totally. meetings, and et cetera. Totally. So let me just jump in because I want to, I think that's a really good nugget to capture, which is you have to sell to the customer, then also figure out how they're going to sell internally. Those might be two different sets of marketing collateral, as it were, what you're selling to them and then their internal materials. Um, just going back to landing your first couple of customers, one thing I think startups sometimes struggle with is because they hear advice like this, which is do anything it takes to close that first customer, right? And, you, and I totally agree, right? You need those first couple referenceable customers. But at the same time, if you come off as too desperate, you're reinforcing the very risk that these people are concerned about, which is, wow, you you really have nobody else, do you? And your entire company rests upon this contract. And wow, you're making me more right. nervous. So it strikes me that there's some balance that you have to strike, which is you, you're, you're trying to do anything. But for example, you're not, you're not discounting to zero the product. You're not perhaps seeming too available. Like you're, you're, you're trying to be accommodating, but you, but you also want to still seem credible. And I wonder like one of the ways that you know, I tried this back in the day when I was doing more enterprise sales was in to selling software was you kind of create these sort of like fake programs like the, you know, innovator circle in the industry or, at, you know, an advisory board or something where you can kind of justify why you're spending more time uh, with them. So it doesn't come off as too desperate. How do you think about that in closing those early, early contracts? No, I think you're, you're completely right. I mean, any enterprise business, its strength is actually around its ecosystem around the company, probably as opposed to what's in the internal company. So any association you can be a part of, which which helps the buyer um, get more comfortable, any industry certification you can have. Um, also think about your collateral really hard. You need, when they ask a question, you need to be able to provide good answers with good collateral and good backup. Um, so just think about all those, all those touch points because you will find a buyer that um, has a larger risk appetite, but what they'll be thinking if they take you on is they can be a hero, right? They can put this new technology in and make a difference in their company. So you've got to set them up for that, for that, right? And you've got to look after them as much as you possibly can. Um, but I would, you know, we have social impact charities that funded us. We, we relied very heavily on them. Um, and definitely think about partners. So we, um, one of our routes to market is through partners, and this gave us instant credibility. So because we have to connect to payroll systems, we'll partner with ADP or Zealous or MHR, which are big payroll companies in the UK. And we walk into the buyer with them. Oh, this is your partner you've had for 10 years. We're just, mm -hmm. we're, our solution sits on top of this very credible supply you've had for 10 years that they're very comfortable with. So that really lowers the risk for that individual yeah because, oh, I, great with one of our existing technologies okay now this and also it takes away that um yeah one of the big points is it's in integration yeah i like that and by the way villagers feel free to post questions in the chat and we can also call you on stage if you want to ask peter a question live uh, this is a live conversation so we can take advantage of this he's a wealth of, of of knowledge and resources here so if you want to be part of the conversation post your questions we can call you on stage we can you can be part of the, the part of the q a here but Peter, I love the idea of how do you establish credibility? And it kind of reminds me of, you know, I sometimes tell founders like your advisory board should be big names with no time and no names with lots of time. The no names with lots of time actually give you advice and the big names are uh, credibility. And if you don't have credibility, the best thing to do is to borrow it from someone else and to, to yes. sort of earn the trust and then affiliate with someone who is credible. So it could be a partner or an advisor or someone who just retired from the industry 
um, and to close those first couple, until you can leverage the credibility of an actual customer, figuring out other people in the ecosystem from whom to borrow credibility seems helpful. No, it's, it's totally correct. I mean, we learn in the early days that this is British CEOs, unfortunately. So they, they love talking to our, a, either Olympic rowers or rugby stars, not interested in footballers. They think they're too lowbrow for them. They like to talk to rugby stars or Olympians. So we have recruited in the history of Waze Dream a number of gold Olympic rowers and some rugby, um, famous rugby captains um, as consultants uh, because they, when they call up a CEO of a uh, listed PLC in the UK, that, that CEO wants to talk to them. Um, they want to talk to them how they won the World Cup or how they got gold in Beijing. And we allow, you know, that was part of how we got some of those initial meetings as well. So think about the ecosystem around your business. Who can you pull in to help you a get credibility, but also, you know, start a conversation with a client. So, um, you know, yeah, that, I love that. I, I think that's kind of underrated. That's like an underrated people are actually astonished at how inexpensive it is sometimes to get sort of like those second and third tier athletes and so on. Um, like we're not talking about like LeBron James, or like the most famous athletes in the world. Right. We're talking about there are people who you can engage at, in your company and it might seem kind of random. Like why, why would some like Olympic athlete be on a pitch call when I'm selling, you know, security software to some CISO, but it doesn't matter. Like you got to get the door open, get them on the phone. And then that, that's the and you'd be surprised. I didn't know this. Right. But I'm telling you, when Olympiads finish their Olympic cycle, they're done. Right. The, the sponsorship yeah. stops, the money stops, the, you know, the, the, Meet, meetings in White House and Downing Street stop. And they're like, what do I do now? Well, guess what? Well, I've got something for you to do. Um, so they, so you'd be surprised if you approach people, you may actually find you, you can get some good people on board that have a really good status. Yeah, so let me just, let's, let's dig in a little bit because Kevin Leland posts this question about selling other stakeholders that are not on the call. Um, and it gets to your, your previous point, Peter, about you know, you're selling to somebody, but then they in turn are selling to their colleagues. And there's like a different set of collateral Another nuance here that I find challenging sometimes is, you know, you have your your initial point of contact in an organization and they're probably not like the CEO of the company, right? They have a boss, they have a, bo a boss's boss. And there's always this, the always advice founders get and salespeople get is like, you know, figure out who has influence and so forth. But it's not so simple as like, just like reach out to this person's boss, right? You don't want to offend them or accidentally sort of like go over their head. At the same time, you do want to get in front of the real decision makers. And so if your entry, you know, if you get an intro or your entry point is into someone junior and in, in, in the real decision makers two levels up, how do you kind of map the organization and how do you delicately like get to the decision maker without offending that initial contact? Yeah, I think number one is know who your buyer is, right? Who is the buyer that you need to create an evangelist of? In our case, it's an HRD. It could be a Operate. It could be anyone, right? It depends on your technology and what you're doing. But make sure you definitely understand your buyer persona and, and who they are. And I don't think many of you will have a problem creating an evangelist out or, or creating a fan of your technology out of one person. But as Ben says, the trick here is to get other people bought in. Now, think about that as well from the message, you know, what you're selling and what is the um, you know, what, what is the core business value you're bringing that client? Because we sell a set of financial tools that provide financial well-being to an audience. Um, that You'd think that was enough, right? But it, I tell you, no one cares about that. The HRD cares about their staff's financial health, but the operations director, the payroll manager, the CEO do not care, right? So we understand, and, and it's always like, I don't know if you guys, I always tell this story, but you should, it, it's... Um, and it's, it's quite commonly, it's quite funny, is when Ridley Scott was trying to get money for Aliens, the film, right? He had to go to the studios and, and ask for money. And when they asked him what he was filming, he said three words, he said Jaws in Space. And the whole of Hollywood, fun, everyone was talking about Jaws in Space. Every, oh, he read Scott, Jaws. It was such a clear cut way. Everyone sees the value of that film. Who doesn't want to go and see Jaws in Space? Everyone sees it. So they gave him 100 million. He filmed it. It was amazing. Right? But the point is you need a Jaws in Space line that goes around that company that know because we sell financial well-being and then we make, we make a, you know, evangelist out the HRD, then he or she's got to go. Oh, this yeah, it's about, it's like we, people have money on their wages. It's flexible. Oh, totally. Integrate with payroll. And then the CFO is like, what the, no one's integrating with our pay. What are you talking about? We have to pay them all our wages. Get out of here. Right. So, but, but, so we've changed our tune now. And it's like, we fill shifts. So when the HRD goes to the CFO, she goes, you know what? These guys fill shifts. What do you mean fill shifts? 
we 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 can't fill shifts. He goes, yeah, these guys are going to fill eleven percent more shifts. Okay, let's go. Right, that is, so we, yeah, that's that's how you get that jaws in space. So think about that because I think it's be I think it's to... I think it's brilliant, and I think it's I think we it's such a good reminder that like as your pitch goes up the organizational ladder, it gets simplified and simplified and summarized and summarized and like you know. So at the bottom of the totem pole, it's like the five page brochure memo, yes. and by the time the CEO reads it, it's like a paragraph, right? And I right. love the the one line or the analogy. So like, ar arming your champion with the summarized version of the pitch, um, and then knowing that like if they're still in the middle of the org, it might get further summarized. And like, what what is that ultimate distillation? I think is such a great insight. Let's bring exactly. uh, Spencer on stage because uh, Spencer has a good question about how pushy to be after initial calls. So Spencer, why don't you introduce yourself and then uh, ask a question about pushiness? Hey, Spencer. my name is. Spencer, uh, founder of buildbetter.ai, and uh, kind of two, two questions in the similar space, which is, you know, had a great call with somewhat of a senior person, but isn't the final decision maker for the buyer. Um, and they might be able to get a demo of our product to be able to use it. But I'm always kind of weary about how much do I want to push them after the demo, how much do I want to push them during the demo? How much do I want to push them during like a demo process of maybe like a few weeks of them trialing our product? And then particularly when it's ready to make the decision, and this is kind of the follow-up question, there's sometimes like long-term blockers where they're saying, oh, we're waiting for a budget review. I have to get my boss's approval. My boss is on a trip right now. He'll get back in two yeah. weeks. And there's like all these little things that start piling up and coming up. And they're like, I love the product. I can't wait to use it. We really want to use it. But then there's like these blockers and I'm like, okay, I'll extend your trial or there's like something that kind of comes up. And I'm curious, like, when do you kind of stop pushing and you're like, this is just never going to happen? And what are like reasonable kind of like, hey, if we don't make a decision by the end of this quarter, you know, our prices are going to be going up or we're not going to be able to extend this deal or whatever it might be. So kind of two questions, how pushy and persistent are you after these calls? Are you making give them give you a no before you kind of move on? And then when you are pushy and you do kind of get these long-term blockers, how do you navigate something that feels somewhat out of their control, but is still really important? To yeah, no, it's a process. great question. You've obviously, you've obviously felt some of those, some of those issues. I'd say, so the, the two bits of advice I'd give is number one, in the early days, you know, being pushy can have a detrimental impact because the buyer knows, right? The great thing about enterprise is, um, it, it's horrible and it's it, well, the, well, the worst thing is it takes a long time to get a deal. But the great thing is they'll be with you for a decade, probably. Right. Because they don't they don't change technologies often. So that buyer knows I've got to deal with this guy for a decade. So if you start being really pushy and you, you don't, you know, you, you, at the beginning, they're like, I don't, I'm, you know what? I can't be asked. I don't want to put up with this individual for the rest of my life because that's how they see things. It's like a sort of bad sort of family relationship. That's how they sort of think about it. So. Um, you know, in, in the early stages, I wouldn't be pushy. However, we've hardly ever closed a deal without being pushy at the end of the process. So once you've got multiple stakeholders engaged, they've made a business decision to go with you and you start to, you know, those signals, you've got them on WhatsApp is a real signal. If you've got the bar on WhatsApp, trust me, they're buying. That's, um, you know, they, they've, they've started the personal relationship. Okay, so let me just, let me jump in there because that's a good takeaway. Unless, the, unless you're on a text a texting basis with the prospect they're not a real prospect is that the claim i love I, it I, honestly uh, once once one of our sales guys starts texting a little thing in my head goes yeah we're they're buying right um so yeah debt so but at the end because all buyers procrastinate and large enterprises procrastinate for a living right that's what they do for a living they're big they're making money um they don't care if it takes another three weeks who cares right they're selling something out yeah so so we've always at the end had to be you know and uh, you know, you have to be a bit pushy at the end and take things away, you know, or, 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 or and stick to that because we've also had situations where it's like, well, you, you're going to lose your discount and then a week goes past. Okay, you still got your discount, right? They, they know that. They've got all the leverage being a big company. You've, you've got none of it. And that's why I'd also look at, um, if we talk talking about enterprise sellers, you need, there's the, the, the enterprise sales, it can be a graveyard of like lazy individuals, right, in enterprise because, hey, you won't see anything from me for six months, but I'm going to, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You need, a, you need an enterprise seller that can close. Um, and it, it actually is quite rare to get an enterprise seller. Some of them are really good at forming relationships, but you need one that can close because it always at the end, there's a bit of angst at the end um, to close. And, and, and Peter, and, and did, you, did I hear you, did you tell us, did you tell some of our founders once at, the, at our UK founder retreat that like when you reference check sales reps, 
if somebody doesn't say they're an asshole or something along the way, you don't think they're great. Cause basically like anyone who's great is going to have pissed somebody no, off. Like this pushing yeah. It. Are they, you know, people respect you at the end. If you push, you have to push these enterprise. They won't do it otherwise. Um, unfortunately they just won't. So we still have those intense conversations. Then everyone's friends afterwards. But what is it? What, okay. So, but what does that mean? What does it mean to be pushy? Like, what are you literally saying? Are you texting them saying, Hey, listen, it's been too many delays. We just got to get this done. Don't waste my time. I'm offended. Like how, how personal are you making it? What is that text of them? Yeah, if, the we've, if, we've, if we've given them a discount or something, we stick to that. So you, you're going to lose this discount. You're going to lose X or Y. So you try and take other stuff away from them. Or, you know, look, uh, we, now we're at a scale, we can say, hey, you're going to miss this integration cycle. We're going to have to do you in March next year or whatever. So whatever, whatever necessary. And it, it's about you to form a personal relationship with that individual as the course of the sale. So just whatever you think is going to uh, rock their boat. But you, at some point, someone's got to make a decision and you've got to make them make that decision. So I'd be, you know, always be professional, always, but be, you can be you can be pushy. Um, and, and we take we take things away from them. Quick, no. quick follow up on that, just to kind of get hyper specific. How pushy do you feel is excessive and how pushy do you feel is kind of appropriate? And you can answer that like throughout the stages. I mean, early on, are we saying like first day we're, you know, texting them or messaging them and then second day we're messaging them and then third day we're messaging oh, that's them. That's too pushy today. early days. I would, the, f the first phase is engage with them, try and form a relationship, give them everything they need to make a decision, right? Arm them with the tools that they need to go to the wider organization and talk to other stakeholders. They'll really appreciate that. Um, if you, you, you know, and it's asking them questions in the early days, hey, who else needs to be involved in this decision-making process? Our CFO, our head of payroll, great. Here's a pack for your CFO. Here's a pack for your head of payroll that has all the information they should need on it. And of course, you know, let them call us. We can have another stakeholder meeting, whatever. Just give them all the information they need. They really appreciate that. Because if you're making them do the work for you, right, that's going to annoy them and they won't do it or they'll procrastinate. So try and give them all the tools they can. And then you've got, you start to build leverage with them. It's like, I've given you everything. You said this was going to happen at this time. Why is it delayed? Like you told me that they'd said, yes, like what do we need to do um, to, make, to, make the, to make this happen? So you can use some of that guilt. Um, at the at the end as well. So what you're doing is you're building up leverage with the buyer the entire way through. But in the early days, you want to be as professional as possible and help them as much as possible because that will pay you back later. I, I hope. Yeah. Um, okay, love that, and thank you, thank you, Spencer, for uh, for that question. Um, just as a, a tactical uh, one that came up from Muhammad in the chat, but uh, what do you, do you have a quick hot take on cold calling, Peter? How? Uh, in general, when you advise companies, not just your wage room experience, cold calling overrated, underrated versus relationship selling? I, I think in I think you do it all day in SME because you can find a buyer that can make a decision. It's a completely different sales motion. I really, I, I really struggle to see it working effectively in enterprise. You may get lucky. Um, what I'd what I'd what I'd suggest or advise is 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 you know, you've got to go through, if you're educating a, a sector or an audience, invite them to a webinar. Right. Take them to a baseball game. Do something like that. That's not like, hey, can you buy this? They're just not an enterprise buyer just doesn't make a flash decision over the phone. You may be able to get a meeting, but I would try and, um, you know, invite them to something, invite them to a webinar where you can educate them or something like something that's 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 less frictionous than a meeting because their time, they'll value their time very highly. And unless they see real business need, they're not going to have a meeting. Um, and if you guys are in the sort of education phase and educating people on your brand or technology, you know, webinars are really good. LinkedIn noise is really good. Use LinkedIn all day. That's where your buyers will be. If they start seeing your brand everywhere, they may they may engage. But I just think the the results of cold calling are quite hard um, because it's such a small you're just not going to get through to people. I find it. So we we try all, all the other types of tactics, really. Okay, gotcha. So let's let's shift a little bit and talk about hiring the first sales rep or two. Um, what would you do differently looking back now at your first sales rep hires? What do you think is sort of like under discussed or non obvious insights for how to evaluate a great rep or what to look for, what the comp package should be if a company is still sort of seed Series A stage? Yeah, it's a good question. So when, when we started um, WageStream, I, I used to work at Living Social, if you guys remember that. It's like a big daily deals. Um, type of operation I was running Europe. We had about four or five hundred salespeople. So when I started WageStream, the first thing I did was call up the five people that would still work with me from Wage from Living Social. And they came to join us at WageStream. That was our initial team. The issue with that 
they were transactional sellers. At, 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 at Living Social, we were selling into SMEs. You know, they were running around town doing deals on a daily basis with small businesses. They weren't the type of people, actually. One of them has, has, has kept going. He's become very good. But um, the, it, transactional sellers aren't the, probably the type of people you want because enterprise is a longer term game. You need to be able to form strong relationships. You need to be able to understand and, and articulate business value in, in, in a strong way. So um, I would massively overcompensate an enterprise seller in the early days in terms of commission because you need those clients, right? You need to have those initial clients and then you can change your commission scheme every quarter as you start to build a base of clients. But in the early days, the, your initial clients are so valuable, I'd very I'd over incentivize um, the enterprise sellers on that. But there's a there's a real nuance with enterprise sales. You get a lot of people that go, the salespeople that go and hide in enterprise sales, right? They're, they're failed salespeople. They go and hide there because they can join a company and sit around for six months and not have to do much. So you really want to, um, you know, look after, look at their activity levels, give them enough um, accounts to go after, but also understand they, if you can try and, you know, ask them the right questions about how they close deals, if they can close that type of thing. So building your but initial- if you don't, I mean, just getting to, to get into how you comp them, like if you don't, um, if you're kind of early days in product market fit, you don't really have a sense for what the sales cycle is going to look like and so forth. Do you think a heavy commission structure makes sense or should it just be a big base salary and figure out the commission structure once you have a more predictable sales model? Because well, otherwise, aren't you setting them up for kind of disappointment? No, that, that's sort of fair. But it, I, the issue I've got with a big base salary is they may just sit on that and not bother doing the work, right? So I would, and sometimes you have to pay by sellers more. So they, 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 they tend to be older and more experienced. But I would still, you know, in the early days, have a really compelling scheme for them, even if you don't quite know what the pricing is going to work out. Give them a percentage of the deal, um, either on an annualized basis or a quarterly basis. You can always change a commission scheme, right? But what you don't, you, what you want at the beginning, they're going to have to. The, you know, the people that get the early sales are going to be very valuable to you um, as a company. So make sure you look after them and compensate them. What I will say is, no one's going to be better at sell at sales than the founder of the business, right? So so don't think that you can i've got this idea i've got this technology i'm going to get eight salespeople and they're going to do the work you sh i still talk to a lot of clients i still get involved i mean portman if is my co-founder um, far far more intelligent than me he, he he's the guy that got a lot of the early deals um and it's great because his californian american accent if you're a british tech you know, an IT director, you just, oh, you, you doff your cap to the Californian <laughs> software. Actually, Peter, don't, don't, under, don't underestimate the power of your accent. I'm, I'm ready to buy just listening to you here for a half hour. <laughs> um, so, so think about like, you need to be actively involved and the buyer likes in the early days, if the founder's involved, then it means you're taking it seriously. They've got a relationship with someone that let's be frank, probably got a much better job than them. They find you exciting. You've got new technology. They may want a job in the future. If you're a bit, if you become a big company, they may want to go a, be a Ned or go on your board. And they're always thinking about their careers. Um, so don't, you know, don't step away from the sales process in the early days because it. it so, may okay. So sorry, let me, let me make sure I'm understanding that point. You're saying the target customer is thinking about their career. And so sometimes the implication of that, which is really interesting, is we're also focused on like the problem that we're trying to solve for their company and, and sort of at the enterprise organizational level. But there's a personal appeal that can be made about their career and staying in touch and and being part of their network and perhaps 100%. even collaborating long term. And, the, and you know, you you present a risk or a gain to their career by then putting this technology or, or, or taking on as a supplier. They're always thinking about their next step, either up their ladder internally or, or in another organization. And they and uh, look, we don't specifically care about careers, right? We're gonna we're gonna try and do this amazing thing. Together. So they have a completely different mindset. If you are if you are a senior buyer in a large corporate, you you're very concerned on your career and you think about that often how how does this me doing this contract does that help or hinder my career so and of course when you get more clients you're much less of a risk and it helps their career and you get more clients it's just it's one of those it's annoying but that it's true I think. yeah so and i'm going to get to laura crabtree's question in a sec because i think it's a good one but just before we get there peter um let's talk about is it about accelerating the sales cycle so is that possible i mean so many founders that we talk to here at Village, you know, we'll say, oh, I'm trying to, you know, the sales cycle's too long. You know, it's taking nine months from beginning to close. I'm trying to accelerate it. Like, 
Is that possible? Do these yeah. markets and adoption processes just have a pace? Yeah. And if you're unlucky enough to be in a market where it's a nine month cycle or longer or whatever, then just deal with it and plan around that? Or are there tactical things we can do as founders to accelerate the, the process? Yeah, there's definitely tactical things. So think about, um, distrib- like think about distribution, right? You are trying to distribute your technology through a large enterprise. Um, how can you increase distribution of, of your of your product? The one and, and in our world, in, in the wage stream world, there's there's friction points with every enterprise sale. One of the friction points is integration friction. We have to integrate with their systems. That's a pain in the ass for them. They hate it. We have to get the buyer to go and beg and steal from the IT department who always say no. So how can we reduce the friction of an integration? The other friction point is contract. Someone's got to sign a contract, right? And that's going to be that's going to be full of friction. How do you reduce the friction of that. Um, so look at your sales cycle. It'll be different for everyone. How can you reduce the friction points? So one way that we did this was with, with like I said before, with partners, we will um, integrate with their existing payroll systems already so they don't have to do a lot of work. And we, we become an addendum. Our contract is an addendum to the agreement they have with the payroll company. And now an, an addendum can be signed within a few days. A full contract as a new supplier could take you months. So think about how you can reduce the friction points um, of that. The other thing that gets come, you know, as you guys know, if you've raised money, FOMO is a is a decent way to try and, you know, build up some, um, you know, not, you know, not for Village Global, but for lesser for firms, any yeah, other, very, very subject. Because they'll always make the right decision. Um, but you, you know, folks, so if we, we're very sector specific, and because we're providing a benefit to um, an employee base. If we, for instance, have three or four hospitality clients and we go to a fifth hospitality client, that hospitality client is competing for staff within that same labor pool. And if everyone else has got wage stream, they have to get wage stream. They they move a lot faster. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I love that. Let me just, if I can jump in, because I think it's what I, I love the sort of somehow pulling upon sorry, competitive dynamics or invoking competitors. Yeah. I also think maybe one way to sort of create some urgency is to sort of think, invent little milestones or or deadlines like there's some conference coming up that you want to present you know the most innovative companies in the sector you want to present about that topic and would love to have you be part of the mix before that date arrives or even something i've yeah. done that's been yeah, weirdly yeah. effective is like travel so for example if you don't live in the same place as the prospect like saying that you'll be in town on a certain date can like people can galvanize action around an in-person interaction and like weirdly those, prioritize. Those are all great tactics. And I love your thing about, hey, we've got this conference, we want you on stage. Remember, their career is important. They love being on stage, right? Why it's good for their career. It gives them it, it gives them exposure. So start to try and pull at those strings. But it's it's the same with the NHS in the UK, which is um, you know, multiple hospitals that we have to sell into individual hospitals. They only care about what the hospital next door is doing to them if they've got waste through. So use use all those levers as, as much as you possibly can and look at the how can you reduce friction in the sales cycle it absolutely can be done we'll sign nhs trust of twenty thousand people now within a few weeks that used to take us months because we've got you know 70 trusts so you, it's a lot easier to get 71 72 it was, it was a pain in the ass getting the first one well and that's that's really heartening so for everyone here who's 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 feeling daunted at the length of their sales cycle it is possible to shorten it uh, you heard it here first from Peter. Um, and these are some great tactics to do it. Let's let's cover another couple, couple of more tactical things before we wrap up. So if anyone has any final questions, put them in the Q&A tab and we'll, we'll try to get to them. But Laura Crabtree says, after the sale, if your customer goes back on commitments, i.e. a logo or, or marketing that was exchanged for a discount, do you push back or just evangelize to keep the relationship? And I think this, this gets to this broader thing around how de- the desperation thing we were talking about earlier, Peter, which is, you know, you, you want to kind of stand your ground and be pushy at the same time, you need them. And so yeah. any any sort of reactions to that dynamic? Um, yeah, I mean, getting getting logos or a case study can be quite tough. We had we developed this sort of ethos called WEOS, which is the Wage Stream Advocacy Operating System. It's a bit of a mouthful. But every single touch point we had with a client from initial introduction all the way through the process was to create, to make them an evangelist. Um, and we do so, we get them to publish on LinkedIn, say they've launched WageStream. And now we're at a stage where we'll launch a client. They will, all, they'll go and publish, hey, we've just launched WageStream because they've seen everyone else do it. Um, so actually they, that's, that's happening naturally to create those evangelists. Um, but I would, it's, it's a tricky one. It's, it's sometimes, if it's in the contract and they refuse, it's a bit tricky. But if you, 
it, 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 again, what Ben says, if they don't want to do a case study and they don't want to be a reference, get them up on stage, get them up on some event or something, and then you can use that. And then they will talk about your solution. You can use those quotes, etc. We just put logo. To be honest, at the beginning, we just put logos on the site. I didn't ask permission. Um, if I've got, a, if if, if we if we signed a big company, I put it on the site. We made the we we put a quote from the HRD that they had given us. We make them look like a hero. If you go to the Waystream site now, you'll see some of our key suppliers. We've made them look like they're at the forefront of their industry for putting these financial benefits to their staff because it helps their career. So think about the case study. In it's not about you trying to. It's not about the case study making you look good as a company. Make them look good as well, and they'll be they'll sign that they'll they'll want to do that case study. Right, big picture of them. They're a, they're a leader in this in their company or their sector because they've yeah they're, they're utilizing this technology and if you if you make it more about them you get what you want they want what they want so think about that thing. i think it's a really and it's one of the themes that's coming out of this conversation i just want to reiterate it for folks who are listening as we try to distill some of the takeaways like i just think this getting inside the heads of the buyer at a sort of personal career level and making them look good thinking about their long-term career prospects i just think is underrated and i'm it's awesome that you're touching on that peter Let's cover a couple other quick tactical questions. So Francis asks, what are the trade-offs of hiring a senior or junior salesperson as the first sales hire? So, uh, you know, uh, you're hiring your first couple of reps. How many years of experience uh, should they have in enterprise sales? And of course, there's always this, the classic mistake founders make is like the fancy resume person. You know, I just rolled out of Oracle where I had, you know, 10,000 support staff helping me. Um, what did you look for for those first couple of reps? Yeah, it's, it's great. I, I don't think you need someone really, really senior in the early days. You need, if they're enterprise sales, anything above five years is, is good for an enterprise sale. They still need to be hungry. You know, if, you, if, if you're making your first sales, um, like Ben says, it's, uh, that individual it probably needs to be different to someone that's been at Cisco for 20 years. People don't realize when they're at Cisco, they ring up a client. They say, hey, you know, it's Peter from Cisco. They get answered, right? When I used to bring up clients, it's Peter from Waystream. No one answered me. Um, I, I remember this. I, I sold a company to Microsoft once and I was a little, it's called iView. No one heard about us. But as soon as I was Peter from Microsoft, everyone picked up the phone. Right? And I thought, oh, you know, obviously my career, you know, but the reality is it wasn't anything to do with me. It's because I was recorded from Microsoft. So don't fall into that trap with some of these people. Just because they've been at a large enterprise company doesn't mean they'll be good for you. Yeah, they, it's, it kind of it kind of reminds me, for those of you who were at our masterclass a couple of weeks ago with Graham Duncan on reference checking and talent evaluation, I Graham had the great... Good. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I learned a ton from that conversation and just so many interesting nuggets about reference tracking. But Graham had the good point about, you know, how talent can be very caught up in the organization they're at. And so you, you're you referencing somebody that's been inside a killer organization with a killer brand. You pull them out of that organization, put them in a new organization. It's not obvious or it's not predictable that that talent will easily transfer, right? Sometimes kind of star power is trapped into their to the organizational brand with which they're affiliated. So yeah, don't be overly seduced by fancy logos on the resume. But did I hear you right that you said at least five years of enterprise sales? I think experience? so because then they've got proven, you know, as as with like life's just a series of problems to solve, right? And especially an enterprise sale is a series of issues and problems. And if they've been creative with those solutions and they talk to you about, you know, that creativity. So ask them, tell me about your best sale. Ask them about their best client. They're all, a salesperson always wants to tell you the story about their best client and then turn it on its head and say, hey, if we call that client up, what would they say about you? What would they like about you? What do they not like about you? That type of thing. Then they can be honest about it. But um, if they, you, you, when you're selling something for new and you know, new technology, creative problem solving is really important. And if they have that in them, they'll figure out a way to get your solution into a company as opposed to someone that's been at Cisco for 20 years and just doesn't have to do that, right? Because basically someone's going to buy Cisco Workday. Which one? Someone. It's, it's, they, they become lazy in their, in their creative problem solving. Well, I, I like that. Let's make sure we don't miss the line. Life is just a series of problems to be solved. I think that's the meaning of life right that's there. Right. Yeah. Put aside leisure, put around <laughs> spirituality, religion, just solve problems. And that's what we got to do every day. Um, <laughs> Uh, Peter, uh, Anthony asks, and we got f uh, a bunch of votes here, thoughts on the freemium model to skip the procurement process, free pilots. What are your thoughts on I, I heavy discount I, free freemium? Yeah, it's a great question. I personally hate pilots because they can go on for a long time and it, it, it means that the organization may not buy you. When we started Waystream, it was a free solution to the uh, company, but we were charging the employees every time they had a withdrawal of their wages. That was the model. Um, and I changed that but after about six months, because I realized that you think free means you remove all barriers. 
um, to an organization buying you. But free is also an issue because there's if, if you charge them and then you get a contract, then they want to integrate, they want to make you go live quickly because the CFO is like, hey, we're paying for this. I want this live. If it's free, it, you can sign a client, but then it could take them up to a year or longer, right, to go live because, hey, it's free. We don't have, we're not losing any money here. So just be careful of that. It doesn't mean it's, it's a silly strategy. I've seen it work. We still do some free deals with big clients, but be aware that free doesn't mean that it's going to move faster. They still have to make a decision. Um, and the free part can, post contract signing, can actually slow things down a bit because businesses will pay free. They sometimes, what's the business value here? What are we actually getting? Why are we doing this if it's free? I actually, I, some of the, sometimes I prefer to pay, right? Because then okay, it's so, so, to, to totally. Pay. Totally agree that free is, is I think, often a mistake. But what about heavy discounted pilots? So the list price is 30 I'll do that. I'll give you Definitely discount um, if, if you, you know, know where, you know, if that's going to incentivize them to move quicker. And by the way, free in B2C land, free works all day, right? But in, in B2B land, um, just be careful because actually what you may be doing is degrading your business value. Um, and but yeah, discounting. Look, we do pilots. I just don't like them because I know it can it can. It's another way to delay a decision. But sometimes they're absolutely necessary. But just make sure you're very clear with the start and end of that pilot. You're very clear on the the metrics that you need to deliver for them to go forward, and make sure you present those at the end. This is what we agreed at the end of the pilot. You wanted to see retention rates of your staff go up by X in our world, or shift uptake by X. This has happened. Now let's talk about the rollout because pilots can go on for a long time. And yeah, oh, we've just another month. Well, let's keep that pilot rocking uh, so just be careful try and control it is my point yes and i also think the word pilot can sound risky inside an enterprise organization like I, I i think of other phrases like charter user or i don't know the innovation circle or something but yeah pilot can sound can sound buggy um we're not ready for prime time if you think if if you think about it lot like what they're really saying is you're too risky for us to roll out so we want to do a pilot to assess the risk. So that's that's what was really going on, right? They're, they no one pilots, you know, Workday. They launch Workday, right? They don't. You don't get to pilot Cisco. You have to do so. Yeah. So just understand what they're actually. And it's fine for them to say this, but what they're saying is you you present a risk, and we need to understand the business value because that's what we're going to do a pilot. So it's it's that's what it's about. Peter, we really appreciate uh, your time and insights. And for the villagers uh, on the call, other follow-up questions, post them in our Slack, uh, founder Slack community, and we can all take a, a pass at, at offering our experiences and thoughts. And uh, and and we'll, we'll also hit up Peter. Yes, like, what's up? Good luck, guys. Always question, why would you want to do enterprise sales? But actually, <laughs> so, yes, yes so exactly. Awesome. The most important takeaway is, what are you doing with your life? Are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> And then if you've made the insane decision to try to sell to enterprises, we covered some excellent tactics. My personal takeaway is just thinking a lot about the the mindset and the customer journey. I mean, sorry, the career journey of your buyer, but also lots of other tactics around uh, hiring sales reps and and, um, and 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 doing whatever it takes to land those first sales. So we'll, we'll send around some summary notes from the conversation. Peter, really appreciate it. And uh, villagers, thank you for joining us. We'll see you soon. Thanks, villagers. Good luck.